Welcome to MMA FanCast. This is Luke, and I'm joined by the new 247 Fighting Championship, 135-pound amateur champion, the mole rat, Cam Hogeyer. Welcome, Cam. Oh, that was a great intro. I had a good time with it. Champ, I can now officially call you champ. So yeah. it's great. There you are. Is it good to be the champ? How are you feeling three days removed from winning the belt at 247 Fighting Championship Saturday? Yeah, it feels pretty good. Um, I don't think I put that belt down for the first 24 hours after winning it. Sleep. Uh, Sleep. Yeah, yeah, I definitely did snuggle up with it. Uh, um, wore it around, went, went out to eat a couple of times, a couple of different places. Nice. Struck up some conversation and... Uh, how did, yeah, people respond? It. How did people respond to you having it in a random restaurant? Uh, there's a lot of stairs. They didn't know what it was. It looks like, uh, I don't know, I bet a lot of people thought I just bought a belt online and started walking around with it. But um, the people who were anyway into MMA, they knew what it was. Um, I had a couple people stop up and they're like, oh, man, you know, um, either they saw it or they heard about it. They saw the pictures. Um I had one guy stop me just to ask if I knew who Cole was. It's like, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm a champ too now, though. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but Cole's really good. Uh, yeah, but like, you know, I just won this. It's like about me. This is your moment. This is your yeah. moment. Well, we're not gonna we're not gonna let the Prince of Pittsburgh know that 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 you had that conversation because you know he's got enough fans. He's got enough. And I, I love Cole Masick. It was great. He was on some of the uh, broadcast with us and. Uh, but I do think it shows something. Even though amateur champion, for some people, might be like, oh, what's the exciting part? It matters. You know, Cole's got a great fan following, so do you. And you're now 5-0 and as an amateur. I mean, that's, that, that's not only a perfect record. It's hard to do that in amateur because there's so much to learn. There's so much um, that you're, you're still trying to put together. And I think from my perspective, having watched – the most recent fight you had for CFFC and watching that fight, um, uh, you know, against the general for your, uh, for your championship, it was almost a flawless. I mean, I, I would say it was head and shoulders above It's probably the best fight you had. Let, let's get your feedback on it. It looked like everything was clicking exactly the way you wanted it to do. What did it feel like for you round by round in there? Yeah, uh, we'll start off first, uh, like the difference between the two fights. Yeah. Um, I will have to say this camp is a thousand times, it was a thousand times better than the one for CFFC was. Um, I had significantly more notice. I think it was announced about, I don't know, four or so weeks before the fight. And I knew about it for another two or three weeks before that. So it was a nice long camp. I was coming off of a fight. So I was already in routine. Um and the camp just went a lot smoother for me. You know, there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes in camps, affects the performance. This was a perfect camp, great weight cut. Um, that was one, uh, there, was, there was a day I was worried about it. Uh, Tuesday night before weigh-ins, I remember I was weighed, uh, I think I was 153 pounds Tuesday night. And I was like, oh man, 35 oh. is far away. But um, yeah, and uh, my coaches, wife nutritionist for the gym she's she's a miracle worker that was the easiest cut ever i felt great going into the fight um physically felt great uh Patton, um he had like a an aura around him um all the pittsburgh guys were like oh well Patton's really good at striking Patton has really good jujitsu Patton's takedown defense is unreal you know like you hear that every time you go to train every time you go to pittsburgh Every time somebody wants to talk to you about the fight, it's how good he is. Because you guys so, were training in the same gym once a week, right? You stayed away from each other, but you got in there to the Matt Factory. So that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, factory, yeah. Guys, yeah. Yeah, Matt Factory guys. And then the people I'm friends with, you know, or, you know, talk to on social media and whatnot throughout Pittsburgh. There's a couple stout guys here and there, Academy guy, you know. Um, so mentally, it was one of the ones that was like, okay, like, is going to be – the toughest fight I ever had. He's going to be good everywhere. And that's what I prepared myself for. Um, but as we got into the fight round by round, it was, it was just kind of rinse and repeat. Like 
yeah. he he did not hold distance like how I thought. Um, I thought he was going to fight me in a similar way that uh, De Jesus fought Ethan Goss. Yeah. Um, in and out, a lot of feints, bouncing, um, a lot of kicks to, uh, you know, chop out that lead leg so I couldn't shoot. That's what I was expecting. That is not what I got. So, um, I mean, I adjusted quickly, thankfully, kind of made it easier for me. Yeah. But it was everything I worked in camp. It was like, all right, you got to close distance. You got to watch for his counters. You got to do this. You got to do that. And he closed the distance for me. Yeah, so it was just. It was- it was surprising. Drop, he was saying on the broadcast, we he he not only was the known more accomplished striker, you know, with his background, but he also has like the size and the arms. It just it seemed like, and I think this is always a part of fighting is you get in there and you want to make your opponent fight the fight you need, and that's what happened. And it's interesting that, of course, he was at a layoff for two years and all that, but we were commenting on it on the. Um, announcing he he wasn't really establishing a distant he wasn't establishing a jab I think he might have used it just a bit more in the third round but it didn't seem like he was working any of those kind of like what you were talking about with John DeJesus um but continue on with with with, with where where you were going I just wanted to say you're right he was closing the distance for you he was letting he was letting you well letting himself not even strike really so yeah uh, yeah, so you adjusted. It was, and it was very surprising. Like I said, it was um, – I think I, I tried – I think every round opening, um, I tried throwing an overhand, just fake shot overhand, easy, low risk, you know, and if it hits, it hits hard. And every single time I threw that, I think he ended up stepping in to avoid the brunt of it. But then it's like, all right, well, you know, like you set up my takedown for me. Um, so first round, I'm pretty sure it was just – I watched it again in the fight. I'll say in the fight, it felt extremely close the entire time. Like sure. the first round, I was like, okay, I probably won that. Second round, I was like, oh man, like he grabbed the Kimura. I felt safe the whole time, but you know, he might have won that round, you know, deep submission attempt. Um, same with the third round. It's like, you know, I took him down, I got a little bit of ground and pound off, but you know, then he got that is that reverse triangle. Yeah. and locked down on it he threw you know i was so in the thing i honestly went in there and i was like this could be for him it could be a split i don't know um on the second watch through it was it, it looked a lot more dominant than it felt right well and i think and i and I, I bet you will agree with me champ is it's better to have a more critical viewpoint when you're fighting than the opposite, which I've seen particularly in amateurs where a guy might be a little ahead in the first round and they just kind of coast round two and three and end up losing because in their mind, it's like everything's coming up daisies and it's like, it's a fight. You still got to fight. And yeah. obviously, I mean, people do know Patton is a purple belt, maybe looking to advance beyond his purple belt. So obviously his submissions were dangerous. He threw up some stuff. Clearly it's a, it's a fight. I'm glad from the outside perspective, it, I would say it was a dominant fight. It was 30-27. There might have been one 29-28, I think. But um, it was a good fight all through for you. Now, one thing you had brought up about the CFFC fight is the CFFC fight was your first time going three, three minutes. And you had talked about th that extra three minutes, one minute per round, is an entire extra, like it's a big deal. It adds up. Yeah. Clearly, everything worked great for you. What did it feel like fighting a full nine minutes where, where you were, I mean, you were moving the entire time, the takedowns, the submission defense, the ground and pound, which, of course, is now wide open to you as an advanced amateur, not with elbows, but at least you have more of an opportunity. What did it feel like? Your cardio looked great. I interviewed right afterwards. You seemed fine. But what is it like now that you're fighting nine minutes hard? Um. I, I like to having more time. Um, I think uh, I, w I watched the broadcast over again. I'm not sure if it was you or somebody else who's saying um, it's hard to get like a rhythm in the two minute rounds because you get two minutes yeah. and then you have a one minute break. So you're resting, you know, almost as long as you're fighting. Sure. So I agree with that. Like it is hard to get, you know, going with three minutes. It's like, you know, you get a position, you could do something with it. You know, you could 
build momentum round the round and keep carrying it through. Um, yeah, my cardio felt really good. Uh, after the CFFC fight, Ray was like, all right, never again, ever. <laughs> None of my fighters are ever getting tired again. And he made sure that, and you know, um, like I do, I do five minute rounds with Ethan. I'm his main sparring partner. So, um, I, I was confident in the cardio to be able to keep wrestling the whole time. Uh, felt good. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Clearly, um, it's all about the training to get you to the point where you, you, your body can handle it. And also, I think it's also the experience. You know, we were talking to Taylor Cahill afterwards, and he was a five-year Division One wrestler. Clearly, ton of wrestling, ton of experience. But for him, and I think a lot of people, of course, that was his debut, he had never thrown a punch. Like, that's what wrestlers don't always understand is that when you go out there and it's pure wrestling, you know what your gas tank's going to feel like when you're wrestling four or five times a day. Um, but throwing a punch changes the way your body uses energy. And so it's always cool to see people transition from either kickboxing and now their energy level is different in MMA because of the wrestling, grappling, or the pure wrestlers transition to MMA where they have to, their body adjusts to what you're doing, which of course is, is what you just did there. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with what you're saying with that is I notice like um, people get really tense whenever they're doing something different. Yes. And that like holding like for for um, MMA, especially, uh, I don't care what background you come from. MMA is different. Like the boxing boxers, I'm pretty sure I don't box. So I don't know for sure. This is what I heard. But boxers, they box pretty frequently. You know, you kind of just hop in there. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll fight this guy next weekend. Sure, let's do it. MMA, there's, you know, six to eight week build up. You're looking at this guy's tape. You're watching, seeing if he puts anything on his Instagram. So it's already in your head and you're getting there like, this is the moment I waited for. It brings stress and fatigue really quickly. So I think that's a lot of the new guys. I think they, they see that the first time they're like, all right, let's take a deep breath, calm down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The tension's different. I, I, I do agree with you there that, when your body holds tension and you see that a lot in MMA. And of course, that's a reason why getting experience. I asked you after the fight, because you're now five and oh, I said, you know, are you looking at going pro? And you said very clearly, no, you still want more amateurs, um, which I think is great. What are you looking to get out of more amateur fights to come for you? I want a couple more fights like that. Bobby one was for me. I, I want a hard fight where I'm pushed, where I got to dig deep. Um, I, I mean, all respect to Pat, and I think he's a great fighter. I think that layoff in hindsight probably did. Yeah. Um, just, just, just the little things that you don't get in the gym. Uh, I think that could have contributed to it, but it wasn't a hard fight. Like I, I kind of, like how I said to you, I was disappointed after because I felt like I kind of coasted. it. Um, you know, like I didn't, I didn't get a finish. I didn't really, you know, have to dig deep. I want a couple more fights like that because whenever you go pro, everybody stuck it out long enough in the amateur to be good, to be able to dig deep. And, right. you know, I want, I want that experience. I don't want my first time being a pro fight and be like, oh man, I'm in deep water. It's like, I don't, I don't want that. So wait for that to happen. And then um, depending on how I react in that, see if I need more time as an amateur or if I'm ready for pro. You know, that is a very honest and I, and I think humble and realistic viewpoint. You want to go to pro and be dominant and actually have, you know, success. And sometimes success in amateurs get people too wrapped up. I, I, once, um, I once coached an amateur fighter and he had a dominant amateur debut. Uh, and he was 100% convinced he was going to go pro the next day. And yeah. it clearly didn't work out for him. And, you know, we'll just summarize it like that. But I think there is such a high that fighters get when things go well and you're doing well. I think it's also great that you know that um, you, you, you want a few more opportunities to be really challenged. There are some great uh, fighters out there. There are great amateurs out there. And um, I'd like to see, because I know you're, you're still adjusting to the advanced amateurs, how are your shins feeling in there? There weren't a lot of leg kicks. There weren't a lot of leg checks. But but how are some of those things going for you now that you're you're starting to become more pro-like? You know, you don't have shin guards. 
you can strike on the ground, which I think your grappling heavy, um, your your grappling heavy style, you know, you get a couple more fights where you grapple, mix in, you know, some ground and pound that works. I mean, obviously, it's always important. You see this at the UFC level. If you get if a top person gets in a dominant position and goes too much Donkey Kong, like too, their base gets thrown off. The person passes, sweeps them, whatever. And what you'll see is, which I'm sure you watch even more than I do with that, is people that have great ground pressure, they know when to mix in the, the strikes on the ground. Is that something that you specifically want more real fight time? It's hard to strike violently on the ground against your training partners because that's, I mean, that's not a good training partner. So is yeah. that something you want to get more? Is that something you want to get more in real fights to come? That yeah, that's something. So a lot of stuff too is like in the gym. I did like a lot more ground and pound than in the fight. Like I, yeah. you know, yeah. feel more comfortable losing position in the gym because yeah. if Ethan gets on top of me, Ethan might hit me one or two times, you know, but he's not gonna he's not gonna put my face through the mat. He's not gonna right. try to hurt me. Like he'll yeah. he'll let me know, hey, you messed up, but that's that in a fight that's different. So I think another thing is just getting those nerves, like it's okay to take risks. There's a lot of times in that in that fight um, where one sequence in particular, I was uh, like halfway around the back. I had that um, like a uh, leg lace in um, and I got the wrist, uh, the far side wrist, pulled it back and my free hand, I was able to strike. But I felt that, that it was there a lot sooner, like probably 30 seconds sooner, I felt like, okay, I could grab the wrist and I did not And then whenever he started to move and the wrist was right in front of me that I didn't really have to risk anything and I grabbed it, but stuff like that, it's like, well, I'm getting takedowns at ease. Why would I not take risk on the ground? So that's another thing that, you know, it's one of the stuff I have to work on and build the experience with is when's the smart time to take risk, um, being comfortable taking a risk, in a high pressure scenario and um stuff like that and uh whenever i start feeling like i'm fighting like how i train in the gym then that's that's the big step i mean that's a that's a very good reflection there you know um reaction time in a fight is what matters only you know and that's a big part of fighting only you know when you first notice something and when you did something about it that's a big part of the transition and also you, you described very well you working with Ethan it's important and I, I think sometimes people don't know this it's important in training to take risks because your training partners that's why every once in a while at the U, UFC level these horrible gym relationships come out you know the TJ Dillashaw versus C Cody No Love and, and Uriah and it's a shame because gym work has to be different it has to be special People have yeah. to be willing to take risks and 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 um, opportunities that they wouldn't usually take. And like you said, Ethan will Ethan will show you, hey, you know, you're in a bad spot now, but the fight's not over. You're not injured severely. You didn't get yeah. a, a loss on your career, and you've got to be able to do that. I had a rule when I was running a gym, and some people didn't like to hear it, but we would go, um, you know, grappling until that person was submitted. And sometimes they're like, well, what happens if I don't? get submitted. Well, you need to eventually like submissions yeah. will happen. Like obviously in a fight, you never want to get submitted. That's an important thing. But if you're not getting submitted in training, it means training's not hard enough. Like yeah. training needs to put you in a spot where, where you, you are too far gone, where you can't get out that way in a fight. Like how bad was that Kimura to us? Obviously we're not in there. I know joints, not to sound stupid, but for somebody who doesn't know, Joints have much less wiggle room than chokes. There's times in chokes, you can kind of hang on, you can kind of understand your limits, but joints don't have a lot of that wiggle room, particularly shoulders, elbows. So how was that for you? And I'm sure you do a lot on the ground. Kind of where's your comfortability with submission defense? Um, that particular submission, uh, that's like a very common, very common one that I've, I, I fell victim to a lot in the past. Um, Matt Factory, a lot of those guys, that's their, that's their go-to. 
Um, Isaac teaches a really good series on that. But um, I mean, you can only get caught in it so many times and then you're like, all right. So I remember, uh, I remember the, the day I learned how to, how to stop it and I've not got in with, with it since. Um, I went up to Ray on Monday and I was like, Ray, two weeks in a row, I got my bag taken, I got submitted. Um, you know, they just stood up off of it. Like I need to stop this move. It's like, oh yeah, all you do is this, this, and this. And you know, you could even get your own submission off of it. I was like, oh, well, whatever you put it like that. There you go. So, yeah, that was like one of the things it was like, I don't know. It was just a position for me. It wasn't, it didn't really feel like a submission. Like, yeah, it could have been bad, but it's like, all right, well now we're in this position, not, oh, I'm in danger. Right. Um, just from, just from being in there. Uh, the, that, and then the same thing with the Geethi and I shoot so much in the gym. Yeah. I mean, every, everybody's wrapped the Geethi you know, Sid, Kate, and Ethan, um, they've all, you know, jumped on Geethi whenever I shot before. Like, it's just a position. Um, you know, you know, you know, it's going to happen in a fight, especially my style. I feel pretty comfortable there. Like, all right, wait, 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 fight the hands, you know, keep his back against the cage, can't extend. Um, keep weight on him, shoulder pressure into his face. So I felt, I felt pretty safe uh, for all of it. The, the only one was the uh, reverse triangle, man. It's just legs are so strong that it's hard to, it, it, it's hard to finish that move just from the angle that your body's at. Yeah. A regular triangle, fairly easy a triangle from that position. It's more or less to trap the body so you could isolate other stuff. So I don't know how, if you guys were able to see it from the camera angles, but the whole time he was, he was elbowing to show the judge or something, but he's looking for my um, my free arm, either a Kimura or armbar off of it, um, which he's digging for. So that was the most danger. I feel like I was in the whole fight, but even then it was like, okay, you know, you're elbowing my back. It's, you know, I'm not going to get knocked out. There's right. nothing vital there. It, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely frustrating. Like I, I can't even grab like to try to push the leg off because right. you're going to rip my arm right off at socket whenever you get the chance. So. Well, that also goes towards, I mean, that also goes towards not panicking. You know, a hard part, particularly when striking's involved in jujitsu exchanges. There's been incredible jujitsu champions that have come over into MMA. Obviously, I'm not, I was watching Ryan Hall um, highlights and man, the, I, I'm assuming you guys practice heel hooks and, you know, for the professional kind of ranks. Um, I'm trying to think heel hooks aren't legal in advanced amateur, right? Just just leg I think they are. I think, um, they are. I think the only difference between uh, amateur and, and pro, advanced amateur and pro, is the round length. Um, only hands to the head for amateurs. And striking. The knees. To yeah, the face, I think that's the it. Kicks, the kicks, the elbows. I think all the submissions are allowed. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, when you when you think of that, but what I was getting to with the BJJ is BJJ changes, changes a lot when they're striking. And it sounds like Patton had you more in a controlled position elbowing you do something you know reach back or do something kind of like you said dumb then now he's got now he's got his finish and I mean the way I've always heard it taught and you're well well past this but for anybody who doesn't know anything when it comes to Kimura's um, Americanas really anything you you got to kind of act like you're a herd of gazelle on the African plains that's how I always described it always heard it taught, right you get something extended from the herd, it's gone, right? That's what happens. You watch these natural graphics, the gazelle is going along, but if they get away from the herd, boom, the lion's got it. I like that one. I haven't heard that before. There you That's go. a good you can one. Use that. Because when I, I taught a lot of basic stuff, and you know, people don't realize when they've never been in a jiu-jitsu situation how relaxed our body, like we're lazy, and our body just kind of, you know, when we, when we don't know what we're doing, we just kind of put our body parts someplace the elbow flares out as opposed to in there's just a lot of things you know all this but there's just a lot of things so that's what i would say is like listen you need you need to be with the herd because right here is the strongest most powerful part right your yeah. your center mass your legs stay in stay tight so it's always great to know that um that you're thinking in there and um and that obviously you knew the risk reward and that was pretty late in the third round. I mean, you had it fairly, um, fairly well in hand at that point. So I appreciate all the 
times you've been on the show. And, um, and it, it's just great watching your career. I had the honor to call your first ever amateur fight. And I remember, I'm trying to remember, was he 2-0 and oh or 2-1? and one? He was 2-1. and one. Two and um, one. Yeah. I forget his name. I, for, I forget his name too. Midwest, uh, Michigan, someplace in Michigan. They came in. Rodney Miracle, that's what it was. Okay, there you go. I think he was from another state, wasn't he? Yeah, Michigan. Michigan. Oh, I did get Michigan right. There we go. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, ever since that day I met you, um, and you're an O and O guy going up against the two and one. I think that just showed the mindset. Gorilla House Gym is so good for you and good for all the people coming out of it. And I, I think it really shows that when you look at your record at five and O, that's not five and O against people who's never won. I mean, you're always from the very beginning, yeah. you're always going up against guys with great records. Thanks for taking That's time out. Congratulations, champ. The next time you're on this show, I need the belt over the shoulder. <laughs> okay, bud. I'll be sure to bring it for you. Congratulations, champ. Can't wait to see you in the future. Keep up the good work. Thank you. All right, bud. Yep. Bye-bye.